Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Virtual Heads Student Leadership Showcase Tour English Edition. My name is Jubekis Montalvo, Executive Director of the Heads Consortium, and I will be your host today. One of the objectives of this event is to promote the wide variety of services Heads has available free of charge. In addition, today we will share a presentation of one expert from our member institutions, Dr. Yesenia Minier, who will discuss about how to navigate when Title IX and cancel culture clash on your college campus. These services and these very interesting topics are part of our mission of supporting your academic goals and increase your chances of success to take your, goal, your academic goals to the next level. Today, we are delighted to have over 100 participants registered from more, from more than 15 institutions in Puerto Rico, the US, and also participants from organizations, including a former head staff, Josman Betancourt, that we say hi. He was one of the first who uh, joined us today and connected to the soon. He's now working, he used to work at the head's office, but now he's working to the, at the US Congress office in Puerto Rico. We welcome all participants who accepted our invitation to this virtual Student Leadership Showcase Tour English Edition. Also, we would like to thank all the deans and vice president of student affairs, the counselors, directors, faculty, and staff of our member institutions for their valuable collaboration to help us promote this event. Welcome all of you. You are the real protagonists of this event and everything we have planned has been thinking about you. Thank you all for your time and Easter interest. Today, be, before we start, uh, we would like to recognize and thank our corporate members who are the sponsors of these events for the valuable support. Diane, if you please go back to the prior, uh, the prior slide, the one with the corporate, the second one. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> The second one, yes, uh, those are our sponsors today, and we really want to thank you for their valuable support, and, and we really appreciate uh, your effort uh, to be part of this event. The next, in the next slide, uh, I would like also to highlight that you can use the chat to write down your questions, either in English or Spanish, for your convenience, closed captions are available in English for this webinar. To activate this feature, click the show captions button that you will see if you are in a laptop or a computer, you will see that on the bottom of your screen in the Zoom uh, room. You can activate that if you think you need the uh, closed captions for your convenience. In the next slide, remember to keep your microphone mute to avoid interruptions. This event is being recorded for the future reference and to share it with the participants who were unable to connect today. We will share, as usual, the link of the recording on our website and also in our social media accounts once the recording is ready. To obtain a certificate of participation and participate also in the raffle, you need to submit your information by clicking on the link indicate on the chat, or you can use your uh, camera of your mobile to uh, uh, scan the QR code and, and submit your information. Please make sure before you submit the form that your name is correct and you include correctly your email so you can receive the certificate when we send it in the next weeks, in the following next week. Uh, also, at the end of the event, you will receive by email the link to complete a brief evaluation to help us evaluate these events and to learn more about how heads can support your needs and interests. Your feedback is very important for us. Please submit this uh, to help us evaluate all of these events and have your feedback uh, uh, of, 
this event as well. Likewise, we invite you to join us in our next event and ask you to help us promote it, inviting others to, record, to register and participate and benefit from these events as well. The next event is the Head Learning Technology Leadership Academy, which is a professional development program focused on developing the next generation of leaders to serve a Hispanic serving institution to promote and facilitate the adoption of teaching and learning technology. And this will be offered in, uh, by leaders in our member institutions that are recognized leaders in the higher educational education community, excuse me, to a group of participants selected by an evaluation committee. You have until May uh, 25 to submit your application and in order to evaluate you and be able to be selected to start this academy that will be from June 6 to June 9. This is going to be two daily synchronous presentations, one in the morning and one in the afternoon of, of three hours each. And this academy is for, professional, for professionals whose jobs is to promote and facilitate the adoption of teaching and learning. So you are invited to apply before June, to, excuse me, before May 25 to participate of this important uh, effort. In the next slide, the next event will be the webinar in English, what is to be done with distant education that was postponed to June 15, that's the new date. And that's gonna be with Dr. Juan Tito Melendez. And we invite you to register, this is free of charge as well. And the final, but not least event of this semester will be a special event uh, with the topic Digital Equity Initiative at California State University San Bernardino. That's going to be in is, is scheduled for Friday, June the 30th. Remember that this event uh, will be held from California. So the time there is going to be 9.30. But if you are connect, uh, you're going to connect to this event from Puerto Rico or from the Eastern Coast, the time is 12.30 for you. So please make sure you have the correct time so you don't miss this important presentation. And the speakers will be Dr. Samuel Sudakar and Dr. Popesco. Uh, you can find all the details of these events at the heads.org menu on the homepage on the, under the menu next events. And all of these events are free of charge and will be held virtually through Zoom. You only need to register to participate. We want to invite you also to visit the Student Placita where you can find a variety of online services, support services free of charge, including the access to databases like the Peterson Test Spread, where you can find scholarships, practice tests, and eBooks to prepare for the text, such as PCAT, LSAT, GRE, NCAT, and that among others. The access to access, excuse me, the Peterson test spread, follow these few steps and click on the name of your institution uh, and enter the passcode. If you don't know the password of your institution, you can either uh, send us an email to info at heads.org or you can text, uh, text to the 787-616-301 with your name and the name of your institution so you, we can send you a text back with the password of your institution. Likewise, at the Student Placita, you can access the Peterson Career Press. This is more focused on how to search or, or to search for jobs and internships, create your resume, and find career advice, among other services. Use the same passcode to access this database. And remember, if you don't have the password right, uh, you can send us an email or send us a text with the name of your institution. We invite you to take full advantage of these services and to follow us on our social media accounts so you can learn more about how our upcoming, more about these services or to learn about our upcoming events. And please do not hesitate to contact us if you need more information at info org, excuse me, info at heads.org. 
Now we are pleased to present our speaker today to this, to this Student Leadership Showcase Tour, English edition, Dr. Jesenia Minier. She is from Western Connecticut State University, one of our member institutions. But first, let me share a summary of her huge professional <laughs> resume that she sent us. This is just a summary of her professional background. Jesenia is the chief Diversity Officer, ADA and Title IX Coordinator at Western Connecticut State University. She has 17 years of experience focused on leadership career, providing vision, strategy, and operational execution to university and municipal agencies with diverse missions and goals. She is characterized as an analytical, collaborative, and success-oriented leader who desires to continue diversity management work at other institutions. Jesenia is, recognized, is a recognized leader with expertise in topics on leadership, women's equality, equality, excuse me, the state of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersexual, asexual, equality, equi, equality excuse me, and immigrant civic engagement, During her career, she has established a network of contacts with local region, regional and national cons constitute groups in the state of Connecticut and New York, including board, boards, committees, government, non-for-profit organizations, and industry leading corporations for collaborative and change management innovations. Yesenia has recently a doctor degree, congratulations, in public administration and organizational leadership at Capella University, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Yesenia is a member or institutional representative at several professional associations and organizations, including HEC. In the meantime, our speaker, now we can stop sharing our presentation, Diane. So, Jesenia can start sharing her, and in the meantime, our speaker is sharing her presentation. Remember that at the end of this presentation, we will have a Q&A session, but you can use, uh, since the audio is uh, unable for you, the participants, uh, you can use the chat to write down your questions during the presentation as well. I will take in note of all the questions, and at the end of the Jesenia presentation, we will have this five to 10 minutes session to a, a, a reply to uh, all your questions. Please do not hesitate to write your question anytime. It could be in English and Spanish. Don't worry that because Yesenia is fully bilingual and she can, either me or her, her uh, she can translate uh, the question, not a problem. So welcome Yesenia. Thank you so much. Remember before you, Share, click the audio button since you have a video to share with our participants. We have almost 50 people connected. So happy to have you. So go ahead. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Well, what a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Urelkis. And thank you for everybody joining in on a Friday afternoon. I'm so appreciative. So I'm going to go ahead and do the share screen. Just give me a moment. Not a problem. Okay. We have in the chat. Remember in the chat, in the meantime, Jesenia, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if it's finishing sharing, uh, in the chat you will find the link for the certificate and to enter to the ruffle. Please do it this. In the meantime, we have the presentation, so you when we finish with the ruffle, your name is gonna be there. Go ahead. Well, as I mentioned before, you know, thank you for joining in uh, uh, today for this afternoon. We have a lot we're gonna cover. Um, I, I'm actually going into my 18th year as a DEIAB professional and lecturer in these multi-subject areas that were mentioned in the introduction. So I, I've got another year under my cap. But I do want to mention the fact how important it is to ensure that when we're having these discussions, they're very triggering, they're very sensitive. So an expectation of the conversation is to make sure that you're actively listening and engaging as much as you can, just to be mindful of language and listen, uh, to hear, not necessarily just to respond, to maintain a sense of open-mindedness. And what's said here should also be left here with a sense of learning. 
expressing yourself using I statements and just being mindful of how you make or how the information that is shared is taken and that to practice a sense of self-care. Take care of yourself as you look to learn more about Title IX and cancel culture and how this impacts you as well as others on a college campus. If you happen to see this particular, yes. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted, but, but I think your camera turned off. Would you please turn it on? Okay. Your video. Um, Don't worry if it's not, not a problem, but I know that you, your video was working, so. I apologize. I guess because when I'm going into the presentation, it might. See, maybe. Yeah. Come on. No problem. Okay. But so, that, don't worry. Okay. So just so that you'll know, if you happen to see this sign, it is because I'm going to show some video content. And again, some of the information that can be shared can be triggering. So I just want you to be aware that if that becomes a situation to let you Belkis know in the chat if you're feeling a certain way or if you need to depart from the, the, the presentation at the time. So I just say that to say that you just be aware of the fact that there is sensitive content. So let me go into just begin start by talking about what is Title IX because when people hear that term, most people are unaware or unfamiliar of what Title IX is. Uh, Title IX is a federal law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in any federally funded educational program or activity. It protects all members on a campus community who experience sex discrimination, sexual or gender-based harassment, sexual assault, interpersonal violence, that includes dating and domestic violence, stalking, or discrimination on the basis of pregnancy. You know, this started initially uh, in, in the 60s as a circumstance where we are looking at athletics or educational programs for gender equity. And it has really expanded its protections to apply uh, to students, faculty, staff, contractors, applicants, campus visitors. And when you think of this as a DEI practitioner uh, like myself, who's committed to creating and fostering a campus environment free of any form of sexual discrimination, it really lends itself as an opportunity to really uh, educate individuals in a wide range of what situations and circumstances are, uh, are looked at, whether it's the protection of prohibited conduct, which includes, uh, as all of the things that I've mentioned, in conjunction with sexual exploitation, uh, retaliation, false complaints, interference with a grievance process. There are many things that, again, this policy covers on a federal mandate that colleges and universities need to be aware of protections from gender-based harassment, against discrimination on the basis of harassment, as well as for pregnant nursing and parenting uh, individuals. Uh, so this, this policy covers a wide range of areas now and has evolved within the last two to three years. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. You know, thinking along the lines of what this looks like in our current state, the executive branch uh, is subject to interpretation for each administration. So right now the Biden administration has proposed new rules to extend those protections to transgender students and expanding that definition of sex to include stereotypes, sex characteristics, pregnancy or related conditions, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, the previous administration with the Trump administration uh, made a great deal of commentary as to again, what this policy looks like on the circumstance of campus sexual misconduct investigations. And currently our current administration is looking to evaluate this to determine how this policy is now weakening protections for survivors of sexual assault and diminishing promise of education that's free of discrimination. So there's a proposal on the table right now to maintain certain levels of guidance from our previous administration, but then to ensure that uh, Title IX has a better protection for all individuals, including those that are in the LGBTQ plus IA community. Uh, recently, uh, Miguel Cardona, who is our education department secretary, has affirmed the fact that they are creating rules with how schools determine these situations, not just within the campus investigation process, but also with how sports teams have full Title IX discrimination, uh, the non-discrimination guidelines, but also how it's looked at amongst uh, sports divisions because of transgender, women and men who participate. So as I mentioned earlier, this is an evolving policy uh, as a federal mandate. And when I think of the word investigate, it really does cause people to assume 
that reporting an issue will automatically get the offending person in trouble. That is not necessarily the case. The role of Title IX and an official that oversees it is to provide individuals with all the options available and to take whatever action a individual who is called a complainant, as well as an individual who is accused who is called a respondent, requests. So there's no one size fits all approach when you think of Title IX. Uh, when it comes to offering help or support to an individual, it is about ensuring that there is a team of individuals that work to address highly personal experiences in a manner that's consistent with each individual's goal, but also to ensure the safety of everyone on campus, as well as to ensure that there's a level of equity that exists within someone's university experience. So to learn a little bit more and to get more in depth, there's a number of different videos that speak about what Know Your Nine is. And there are normal facts that you should know for colleges and universities uh, that we're given guidance about on how to handle Title IX. So here are some facts in 90 seconds about Title IX. Enjoy endless possibilities when you rinse together. Apologies. Not sure what just happened there. All right, let's give this one more try. See, usually the ads are always there, but don't worry. <laughs> Clip again. And if you can turn on your camera when you have the time during the meantime, it will be great. Double click. Play. Uh -huh. In the meantime, welcome to the ones who are joining. Thank you thanks so much. It's we we are really because in during the practice it was okay. It was okay. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. but let's see. You know how it is. We are live. Sorry for the <laughs> technical issues as usual. You know, technology is always uh, mm -hmm. an interesting fickle situation as we well. That's true. But it's getting there. Apparently the bandwidth of the internet there are just do you do you need the play button right already? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's loading. It's weird. And your seat, your internet signal looks fine on your computer. Mm -hmm. Everything looks good. Oh, so yeah. this is a little. Well, no, we have time. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> I don't know if you refresh or something. I'm, I'm not sure. It is, Carlos Barbosa say it is the bottom, not the center one. Okay. El que está abajo. Okay. Uh, I'm, what I'm going to have to do is, what I'll do is I will send this to everyone as part of the uh, package for the presentation. I'm so sorry. I'm not sure what's happening here where it's no, not but, playing. Uh, but, but when you click on the bottom, in the, the bottom that is, down in, in, in abajo, just saying. Yep. Oh, right. Here we go. Okay. Nine, Nine things to know about Title IX in 89 seconds. One, Title IX is a landmark federal civil right law that prohibits sex discrimination in education. Title IX is not just about sports. It also addresses sexual harassment, gender-based discrimination, and sexual violence. Two, Title IX does not apply to female students only. Male and gender non-conforming students are protected too. Three, schools must be proactive in ensuring that your campus is free of sex discrimination. They can't just wait for something to go wrong. Four, schools must have an established procedure for handling complaints of sex discrimination, harassment, and violence. Five, 
Schools must take immediate action to ensure that a survivor can continue his or her education safely. Number six, schools may not retaliate or let someone else retaliate against a victim filing a complaint. Seven, schools can issue a no contact directive to prevent the accused student from interacting with you, kind of like a restraining order from your school. Eight, in cases of sexual violence, schools are prohibited from encouraging or allowing informal mediation of the complaint rather than a formal hearing. Nine, schools cannot discourage you from your continuing education since you have a right to education under Title IX. You have a right to remain on campus and have every educational program and opportunity available to you. If your rights aren't being respected, you have options. Visit knowyour9.org and check us out on Facebook and Twitter. So just thinking along the lines of how important it is for you to know this is because of the fact that, you know, many cases illustrate that students often lack clarity about what the procedures are and how they're applied at every school. Schools should provide more information and education to their students, faculty, staff, uh, prospective students, their families, uh, and the like about what the formal reporting mechanisms are, how they work, who's protected, and what counts as a situation of sexual misconduct. Uh, many people are unfamiliar or unaware of these circumstances, and I want to kind of do a little test here. So uh, on your screen, if you have your mobile device, if you can please uh, utilize the QR code, uh, as well as going to www.menti.com, use the code 51104271. I've actually put the QR code uh, up for you to utilize this because I'd like to get a response from the audience about, do you know who your Title IX coordinator is on your campus? So when you're yeah. ready. I don't see the QR code, just any, I can you put it? Bueno, I get some. You oh, see okay. it now? Thank oh. you, yes. All right. Okay, you can use the chat as well. <laughs> and please don't be afraid to be honest about the response because I really want to show the fact that, again, some people may be unaware and some may be, and there's no right or wrong on this. Just, Dr. Carlos Barbosa said that he doesn't have any idea who he is. <laughs> hey, hey, and there are others. Putting. If you can access or you don't have your mobile with you, you can put it on the absolutely um, the chat. And I will read it for Jessenia. Jessenia, I can turn off your cam, can on your camera, can you? In the meantime, if I you... if I do that, I get bumped off of the presentation. Don't ah, worry, okay, but don't worry, don't worry, but don't worry. But we prefer to hear your voice and don't lose the presentation. Okay. You can share your comments and questions in the chat. Yes, gracias, Diane. And we still have people joining us. Welcome, everyone. For those joining in, I'm, I'm posing a question as to whether or not you know a particular official on your given campus. If you have a mobile device, please go into www.menti.com and use the code 5110-4271. It's on the screen. You can use the QR code. Uh, to the left-hand side of the screen uh, and answer the question as honestly as possible. There's no right or wrong answer. It is just to demonstrate some discussion about Title IX and individuals' understanding of the uh, practice and who the official may be on the campus. So for those that are still joining in and answering the question. I just want you to see that for those that have answered, thank you for doing so. Uh, recognizing that half of individuals are familiar and half are not. And I appreciate the honesty because there are many students on campuses as well as even staff and faculty that are so oblivious and unaware of who this individual is. It could be a person who shares the role with someone else. It could be someone who has a dual responsibility, but it's not their primary responsibility. And there are some campuses who have someone who is completely dedicated to this job responsibility, but their visibility on campus is very minimal. 
And so many people feel that the visibility creates a stigma, which is not necessarily the case. It is just a question of making sure that people are educated and know what, who that individual is and what that person can do for them when a situation comes about. Because it's not always about compliance, it's also about guidance and providing information for education. All right. I'm going to move on now. And so again, <laughs> I thought I had these instructions um, beforehand, but this is something so that again, if you happen to note, I'm going to ask more questions that are interactive, please make sure that you either take the QR code. You can also see the presentation from a mobile device as well as we move forward. So just note that if you're in it, you will continue to see the presentation from your mobile device also, okay? Now, I asked earlier if you knew who your Title IX coordinator is. Now I wanna ask, do you know how to find statistics or metrics at your institution that are related to Title IX? So if you can please answer that question as honestly as possible. Again, Dr. Barbosa, Carlos Barbosa said that no. He okay. Help. <laughs> because probably he doesn't have access, but the QR code is working perfectly. Okay. And for the ones who just join us, uh, you if you need uh, closed captions, the, the, you can use the bottom activate it and make sure you select English and it's working perfectly as well. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So as those continue to go into the system to answer the question, this, this tells everything. You know, some people may know who the person is, but to find information about what is happening on a given campus, it doesn't surprise me what we're looking at here, because this is information that should be readily available on a campus, uh, not only for you to know who the official is, but how to find the metrics that tell you about your campus safety statistics, as well as whether individuals have experienced situations that are being investigated on the campus, whether it be, again, sexual assaults, whether it be sexual harassment, whether it be domestic or dating violence, these are statistics that should be out there and very prevalent, but many institutions feel that by putting this information out there, it is creating a stigma. And that is not necessarily the case, but this is also by law, something that should be published as well as available within a campus community, okay? So thank you for those that are participating in the questions. Again, there's going to be some more questions that I'm going to ask. So again, make sure to keep within the, the presentation, you can still look at it through your mobile device as well as through your PC. You know, the role of the person in a Title IX coordinator position is a vital one for educational equity. And it is an internal staff person who's accountable for ensuring that schools that are public, higher education institutions, educational providers address the full scope of Title IX, which is the prohibition of sex or gender-based discrimination uh, many institutions who have a role like this play a vital role in protecting all students, staff, and faculty, both male and female, preventing and addressing any unlawful sexual or gender-based discrimination within a school. In overseeing compliance, coordinators are the catalyst for equal opportunity in all areas covered, whether it's athletics, whether it is uh, education that is within the classroom or outside of the classroom, uh, employment, as well as all aspects of social and emotional learning happening on the campus. So when you think of this now, very big policy, very big regulation, in thinking along those lines, then you have to remember cancel culture and the evolution of cancel culture and how that begins to take shape on a college campus. You know, it's defined as a variety of descriptors. It's best defined as boycotting those in position of authority or power when there's public speech, behavior that goes against popular doctrine or mainstream belief. Uh, there's a lot of debate on college campuses about uh, cancel culture and its impact and the attempt to suppress free speech or the exercise of free speech. You know, the intent with that is that it's false, but regardless of one's perspective on the merits of, uh, of cancel culture, it is creating situations where for Title IX coordinators and school administrators that are being canceled for attempting to maintain equitable Title IX environments becoming very difficult. You know, I'll use the example of a university in Rhode Island recently 
uh, where students pressured a campus administrator to submit their letter of resignation for publicly addressing a professor's comments on the use of pronouns. You know, there are many universities that are going through a great deal of these types of situations. Uh, and, and Title IX coordinators are really getting a huge uh, rap about showing levels of incompetency with addressing uh, whether it be parties within an investigation and how also social media is contributing to this lack of any process that should exist within a college campus. So these are just some examples about how campus administrators face uh, cancel culture and confront it based on Title IX compliance. But it, it can hurt as well as bring a sense of social uh, stigma to those who are experiencing it, whether you're a student, a staff member, a faculty member, or someone affiliated, it, it, it creates uh, a shame, a sense of drain, and it takes a toll on someone's wealth, health and well-being. You know, thinking along the lines of cancel culture, you know, for those that are untenured in their faculty status, for those who are uh, junior administrators, it just takes a form of, uh, of public humiliation, but also a sense of, uh, of fear in how to exact these types of protections for others. And there needs to be a sense of sensitivity or at least uh, uh, training about sensitivity and implicit bias that addresses these things because it's really becoming very prevalent on college campuses. So the next video presentation that I'm going to present happens to introduce this subject matter and how it coincides with Title IX, but also the impacts that people experience. They remember to use the button on the bot. Ah, ah, perfect. Got it. Ultimately, it's speech responding to speech. Someone says something, and other people respond by saying, "That was terrible. They should be fired," or "That was terrible. We should stop buying their music or watching their show or whatever it is." You know, people conflate holding people accountable with cancel culture, but I, I do think it's like. Like many terms, it's a term that's come to encompass a lot of things. Why people always bring up the First Amendment when they're talking about cancel culture is that any, anything that makes people hesitant to share their views, uh, that's called the chilling effect, um, which cuts against free expression and the value of freely expressing yourself. Um, it's not going to violate the First Amendment because that only applies to the government chilling your speech. Uh, it doesn't apply to actions taken by private companies or private individuals. But, you know, it's still worth discussing in a space like this, because even if it's not a First Amendment issue, it is something that impacts what the First Amendment is meant to protect, which is free expression. If there's value in cancel culture, it might be like causing institutions to change like um, their, pro their policies and things like that. I don't know if you can change a person by canceling them, except to make them sort of um, angry at cancel culture. What are you trying to accomplish with your speech? What are you trying to accomplish by, by canceling someone? Um, like for instance, if you're, you, you always hear a story about a professor who has made questionable remarks in the classroom. Um, if you are calling for them to be fired, are you trying to take a stand against institutional racism in the academic system? Or are you just trying to ruin someone's life? Like, I think that's the difference between um, employing this for the purpose of a, of a movement, for a, or like that's what a boycott would be, um, versus just canceling someone. Are you furthering a cause or is this sort of personal? While I think that it can do some good things and if it's used in the right way, if it's used as more of a, a boycott for a cause than actually just to ruin someone's life, the truth is if people feel afraid to express their views um, because of cancel culture, um, if they just stop their ideas before they're even like, they've even taken form, that's a chilling effect, that's bad. It's bad for free speech. On the other hand, cancel culture is free speech. Okay, all right. So I'm coming back to asking a couple of questions. If you just joined us, please ensure that if you could use your mobile device to either scan the QR code or to go into www.menti.com and enter the following code so that you're able to answer and participate in the following question that's being presented. So in viewing the video that we just saw, 
whether it's in English or in Spanish, what words come to mind when you think of cancel culture? And as you answer, what I'll say is with the help of social media, you know, speaking of about social injustices has become a lot easier and a lot more convenient. And out of this resurgence, we've seen a new culture form, which is called cancel disclosure. And the language that perpetuates in cancel culture, it's threatening the very fabric of what academic institutions are looking to promote. Uh, colleges and universities across America are overwhelmingly trading their long held ideals, particularly those related to academic freedom for new ideals created under cancel disclosure. And just thinking along the lines of silencing any disclosure that may be interrupted as transgressive in nature. So this is really taking a huge evolution in what colleges and universities are giving up with the ideal form of liberal society, particularly those related to just being open-minded. It's really taking that toll and ultimately goals with canceled disclosure attempt to achieve work to reinforce the very social injustices they attempt to tear down. So, okay, so we got one. Censor, so anyone else feel brave enough to put out what they think of when they think of cancel culture? Absolutely. You know, we, you know, the intent with cancel culture is to ensure that you're looking to positively impact the campus, but there are times where we see students using social media to exact what they feel are their forms of justice, and it can create a negative impact rather than the positive impact of wanting to change an institutional situation. And then it also creates a situation where harassment as well as other areas with uh, injustices along policies begin to come overlapping. And so it's, this really is becoming something very prevalent. And so in, in the role that I serve in my institution and for those who do serve in that role, it's challenging. It's very challenging to really see the balance behind uh, ensuring that people have the free opportunity to say what they choose to, but what they say may be an impact because when one is investigating a claim or a complaint, it's an allegation. It's not necessarily something that is established or verified. And so taking that form of uh, action could be detrimental. Thank you for those who participated. Also, the next question. Yesenia, excuse uh -huh. me in the chat, Gregorio Gomez said, right, Sidney Barnado said punishment, it's eliminate the conversation needed for understanding and growth. Mm -hmm. And oh, Josman uh, Betancourt also said a modern perch. It limits the discussion among different point of views. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. It's why it leads to the next question. You know, is it possible to overhaul a person or a school's image after being canceled? So when someone uses social media, when someone uses other platforms, to exact situations, do, is there a possibility to overhaul those situations that create this image? So again, I'll allow you to go into your devices and answer as honestly as you choose to. Sorry, Justenia, but I'm not kind of acquainted with the overhaul. Can you use like a synonymous, another word? Because I'm not sure what that In means. other words, when okay. someone is impacted from cancel culture, can the image that that person has built, their reputation, can it be, um, can it be preserved or is okay. it destroyed after being canceled? Oh, okay, thank you so much for this. Okay. All right. So thank you for those who responded and for those who participated. You know, it's a hit or miss depending on a given situation. 
There are times where, again, the use of social media can bring negative impacts to someone's image or their, their uh, reputation. There are some times where it brings positive because of the circumstances that are held. You know, we're seeing now played out on, on social media and in the news about uh, our former president, Donald Trump, who is experiencing such, you know, lawsuits and issues. And yet his popularity is, is still, it's, we're still navigating within his popularity of, of running for president. And so when you think of that versus, let's say, Harry Weinstein and uh, the Michigan State University situation with uh, Larry Nassar, uh, you know, that brought negative stigma to the institution that, that obviously brought uh, awareness to uh, the victims, but it, it also brought a, a, a negative impact overall over how an institution can handle a situation or how a person uh, is impacted or persons. So thank you for those who participated. Okay, so this is the last video presentation that I'm going to put out about, again, the negative impacts or overall impacts. I don't wanna say negative, really overall impacts with cancel culture and how uh, those impacts can really be a struggle. It's a phenomenon you've probably heard of and you may even have fallen victim to. Cancel culture has been discussed across social media with regard to celebrities and politicians, but it's also a very real part of life for teenagers in schools across the country. In an article titled Tales from the Teenage Cancel Culture, reporters from the New York Times set out to discover what cancel culture is really like for American students. Sanam Yar writes about youth culture and social media for the New York Times. She's one of the authors of that story and joins me now from New York City. Welcome, Sanam. You interviewed a number of students for this story. What did they tell you about what cancel culture is and how it's showing up in their schools? Right, so I think what um, myself and my colleague Jonah Bromwich found was there was a really wide spectrum of experiences. It ranged from canceled, meaning like nothing, it was a joke that you would sort of say in passing, to more serious cases where it resulted in kind of like social isolation. And in many ways, this isn't something that's brand new. Bullying has always kind of been existing in, in schools, but I think the new thing here is, or different thing here is that it seems to stem from some sort of perceived moral wrong kind of inciting the canceling. Is it happening on particular types of campuses or is this pretty much nationwide at this point? I think we interviewed people like in middle school, high school and colleges. It seemed to be, it wasn't really one specific place, mm -hmm. but I definitely it varied depending on where Right, and, and in fact, in your article, it's a funny moment where you explain that getting canceled is so common now that for many teenagers, it's more of a joke. There was a line at, at a party where a student says, she heard someone say, if you haven't been canceled, you're canceled. Right, <laughs> so exactly. Some can see the humor in it, but some of the students you spoke to had a more serious experience with it. Can you tell us about some of their more sobering experiences? Right, so I think in some of the more serious cases, uh, what we found was that it was a lot of um, bullying, but via social media. So they would kind of feel like they were being piled on by their peers, multiple peers through Instagram, TikTok, different mediums. And it just kind of really resulted in social isolation and uh, made them question whether they were a bad person, whether they were a monster in some cases. But that was the most extreme kind of end of the spectrum. So uh, President Barack Obama actually spoke out against this recently at a summit in Chicago. Let's listen to what he had to say. But I do get a sense sometimes now among certain young people, and this is accelerated by social media, there is this sense sometimes of the way of me making change is to be as judgmental as possible about other people. And that's enough. Like if I tweet or hashtag about how you didn't do something right or used the word wrong verb or then I can sit back and feel pretty good about myself because man, you see how woke I was? I called you out. <laughs> you know, that's not, that's not activism. That, that's not bringing about change. 
So, you know, there is that argument against cancel culture that you don't have a full spectrum of opinions and ideas at the table and you don't have a chance to convince people to think differently if you just cancel them, correct? Right. I think the common sort of criticism against it is that it can sort of create an echo chamber because if you're, you might not be willing to associate with or listen to the ideas of people who might disagree with you, but that's just one of the criticisms I've seen. And do you think that this will be more of a fad or you think it has legs? I think, well, kind of like I said, Canceling is just a new term for a human behavior that sort of always existed. The only different thing here is that it's maybe exacerbated by social media and also people are willing to speak more about things, that, about social wrongs that they see. And yeah, I think that does have legs. Sanam Yar from the New York Times, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So again, we're gonna do one more poll survey. So I'm just putting out the information so that you know uh, to either scan the QR code, go into www.menti.com and use the code 5110-4271. All right. I'll also put the QR code in the actual slide. So when you see these examples of high profile individuals being canceled on social media in the news, does cancel culture, know, knowing this that is happening so prevalently in society, do you think this is happening on on college campuses, even thinking of your own college campus, do you think it's happening? Okay. And please remember, these are anonymous. You don't, I don't see who answers. It is just a question of you uh, answering as honest as possible. Uh, Yesenia, Dr. Barbosa said that yes, mm -hmm. in his campus he has yes. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it, it takes on different forms on different campuses, whether it is about, uh, you know, let's say students feeling a certain way about uh, programming or again, in my role, when I investigate claims of, of sexual misconduct on campus, uh, where students may feel very indifferent about a decision or a determination and will take to social media to address these issues. It really puts a strain not on just the students involved, but it also puts a strain on the administrators that are trying to exact the policies and practices that exist for, the, for, their to, for them to do their job or for them to be able to provide equity on the campus. It's a very difficult uh, place to be and you know how do you balance that how do you manage that it's a really difficult place but there are ways and strategies in which one can really navigate these situations on the campus and do so in a way where you're respecting the people who have the differing opinions and want to exact their free speech but then also to ensure that you're educating about why certain practices and certain policies exist and what the nature of their protections are so just thinking along of a, of a review of this you know, recognizing, so this is a question that I'm going to answer, uh, you know, how responsible can it be for one to determine through a neutral process whose rights are? So again, as an administrator, it is very complicated to know that the, there are so many situations that we run into uh, with sexual misconduct or with discrimination that has a fine balance and trying to bring a sense of empathy and understanding and also uh, an approach that allows for you to be very uh, neutral, if you will, in that response is very key. So if you are a student hearing another student, if you are a faculty or staff member hearing the experience of a student, bringing a sense of empathy and support to what they're experiencing, recognizing where they need the support and if they need someone to help them, again, like a Title IX coordinator or a support person, if you will, that could help them navigate a neutralized process within an administration is very helpful. Now, this is a question that I'm gonna ask you. There's no need to answer a question or, or anything, but I just want you to think about what does the Title IX process look like at your campus? and who goes through that process. It is very different for a student 
versus a faculty staff member or someone who is external of an institution when they're going through an institutionalized process. It is very intimidating. It is very uh, uh, noted that the person may be unfamiliar with what they're going through. So thinking along the lines that when you hear of someone going through an experience with an administrative process to again, exact empathy, provide support or volunteer to be a support person to that individual until they are able to find the appropriate resources. If there's a need for mental health services or health related services to ensure that they are aware of what information is available. The Title IX coordinator should have this information uh, completely available to all individuals on campus um, and, and provide those level of resources as a support person. Uh, sometimes a Title IX, coordinator, Title IX coordinator may have support people that can help to uh, support an individual outside of the process of the Title IX coordinator. So, so there's many different forms that this may look like on a campus. And I would encourage you to look in your campus to see again, who is your Title IX coordinator, what resources they offer, what accommodations they offer to individuals, and what protections uh, are available within your institution so that you know what you have available and what is there for you. You know, so thinking scenario wise, what do I do if someone tells me they've been sexually assaulted or harassed, but they do not want to make a formalized complaint? Again, going to social media is not something that I would encourage. However, it is your right. But again, exacting what resources are available on a campus and ensuring that that person is aware of what those are or putting them in touch with who your Title IX coordinator is would be absolutely one of the key things that you can do to support that individual. And also to ensure that you're not um, withholding information from the administration. You know, I, I teach about something called deliberate indifference. And what that means is when you are aware that someone has experienced a situation and you do absolutely nothing. And during an investigation, if I find that someone has deliberately not provided information, and while well, they may say that someone told them, again, whether it's a student or another colleague, the, the person told them not to say anything, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have no responsibility. It is really important for you to address and to ensure that if you are aware of a situation that has occurred on a campus, that you're not, again, falling into that definition of deliberate indifference and that you're providing opportunities for that person to receive services, but for the administration to address an issue uh, wholeheartedly. You know, as a college student, you discover that you are in the same class with an alleged respondent your friend told you about who was named in a complaint of sexual assault. What do you do? I would say absolutely nothing. It is not easy because the key here is alleged. You know, that means that someone is uh, a part of an investigation or part of a review of what's going on on the campus and what's going on within a given situation. So there is nothing that says uh, that this person has committed a crime or committed a, an act, if you will, I don't want to say crime, but committed an act on the campus. Um, there are parallel processes that exist when it comes to acts that are reported to an institution and acts that are reported, uh, let's say to a law enforcement agency. And so we want to ensure that those practices are moving forward before there's anything that is done. But what you do is absolutely nothing. Just again, ensure that you support the person that you're aware of. So how do you support your friend? Again, by making sure that they are aware of the resources that are available, getting them in touch to their Title IX coordinator or support individuals that are on the campus. Um, Going back to the question, is social media a good outlet? It can and it cannot be. If you're talking about a singular individual or a micro situation, such as your friend telling you something or a student coming forward with something, uh, no, I would say social media is not a good outlet. But if you are looking to exact a change of institutional practice, uh, something that is macro, that affects everyone. Obviously, social media can be a good outlet, but we want to ensure that there is a balance to that. So just those are some of the issues to think about when you think of first investment and when you think of obligations of a school. Um, just thinking along the lines of making sure that, yes, we want you to speak up. We, we want to ensure that a voice is heard about what issues are happening, but we want to ensure that Again, for someone who is experiencing a situation of sexual misconduct, that their privacy is respected, that they, they exact the confidentiality that they choose and what their choices are 
with addressing their issue. Some individuals do not wish to file complaints or move forward with any action, but to get resources and help. Some individuals do choose to do both or to file just a complaint. It is up to that individual. So recognizing that there are so many ways to bridge public expectation with compliance obligations in ensuring that you know what your rights are. Title IX administrators assess and try to anticipate where lightning rod issues are within their campus and to coordinate with partners, whether it's a legal counsel, whether it's a communication office or others, when messaging doesn't cross a line unless it's intended to. And so in, in ensuring that we want to bring a sense of, of, of balance you know, attending a training that under, gives you a fair understanding of what your school investigation standard or process is. Meet with your Title IX coordinator or members with a, with a team, especially when it comes to respecting the support functions that they offer, you know, knowing the scope and limitations of the First Amendment, but also the positive, the potential impacts that it has on a Title IX process, as well as the institutional goals and priorities, you know, in, in, in line with administrators and those that are part of uh, a workforce, just developing protocol to address cancer culture and free speech, but also in partnership with other constituents to address what that may look like and how to respond in a way that there's an impact, okay, but a positive one. Learning about what your school resources, the tools, all of the uh, mechanisms and the infrastructures that are built in to have difficult conversations, whether it involves opposing opinions or those that are expressed opinions. Recognizing that opposing opinions on any given matter adds value and richness to an educational experience, we want it to be positive, you know, and finding safe locations on campus for you to express those situations and circumstances that you're experiencing, or if you feel as though you're being targeted. Okay, these are just some of the recommended areas that I would say that you want to look at when you're thinking about this because cancel culture is new in terminology, but it's not new in practice but neither is Title IX compliance. So to be better positioned to navigate this to the two is to be strategic, to be well-informed, and also to know what's available for those who experience, it, experience these issues, but for also for yourself as an advocate. You know, the master to support individuals without taking a side is very, very difficult. But to show that you understand all the arguments around the issue, that you recognize the humanity of the participants who are in conflict, the pain that they are likely experiencing and often the fundamental values of those in conflict perceived at the issue is really important. So creating that foundation that, you know, there are public forums, there are areas to really be consistent in messaging and centralizing communication is very important, but also timing is very important. And just making sure that you offer to meet detractors but also if you are the detractor, that you know what conflict, what conflict you're going ahead wherever possible and to sharpen that negotiation skill for the demand that you're looking to make for positive impact and change. All right, so I have here on my slide just questions from the audience and a thank you. What I'm gonna do is get out of the presentation so I can turn on my camera. Okay, right. okay perfect. That sounds great. And in the meantime, you do that. Let me remind everyone that we have a, at the end of the Q&A session, we will have a raffle of four uh, Amazon gift card of 25 each, only for students. Sorry, but this is important to highlight that if someone on the audience wins that card and is not a student, uh, we have to give it up and... and, and, and um, select another person because these gifts are for students. So, uh, but everyone, please click on the link on the chat so they can enter the raffle and also uh, request the certificate. It's very important. You have few more minutes because after we we need to download this list and then a uh, and then uh, uh, start with the raffle. So, any questions? Uh, let me. Check the, bueno, I just see here, great presentation. Thank you, Josman, for your comment and for being here. And Josman, I know you're a master a master degree student, right? So you, you can uh, enter to the ruffle, definitely. And another, see me say another great presentation. Thank you so much for your comment. Any question? This is the time. Uh, I was, uh, um, in the meantime, somebody write questions. Uh, Jesenia, let me ask you, I was uh, the Title IX 
Uh, I was confused when you sent us the brief because I, I'm not acquainted with the term. So this is the term that uh, you, we use only in higher ed or in institutions, or it's something that they use for, a, a, applies for everything. It applies for everyone. So okay. it is applicable to K through 12, higher education okay. institutions, as well as community or charter schools. So yes, this is a, a broad blanket federal term. Okay, great. And then uh, we have a question here, uh, Justenia in the chat. I don't know if you can see it. I'm going to read it uh, for the recording because in the recording, the chat is not uh, seen. So Naomi Velasquez said, if someone, for example, got canceled for something they did a long time ago, but no longer share that same opinion as before, would you think it is good to still hold it against them? Hmm. Very good question. You know, our guidance with Title IX is evolving. And one of the processes that are now being instituted is something called informal resolution, where it allows for all parties to uh, mediate their situation and to figure out ways for them to be able to move forward. It's, it's sort of a way for there to be an option uh, for situations like this where there may have been time that has passed, uh, but it allows for uh, a, a, a way to respond to the situation in a very holistic approach. And it is something that's new that's been introduced to institutions for the last two to three years about having informal resolution processes. So I would say for a situation like this and for a person in my role, I would most certainly recommend an informal resolution, a way that there could be a mediation to allow for there to be uh, an action step in addressing both parties and to exact an opportunity to have conversation. It's ways where there could be restorative justice, if you will, uh, action on the campus. Uh, for some it works and for some it doesn't, uh, but it's an option that's out there. Just man, thank you so much. And please, uh, uh, Naomi said if that answer, I, I think it did, but if you have any other doubt, please make sure uh, to write it on the chat. And Josma said, how can Congress ensure compliance with Title IX through legislation, legislation, excuse me, or funding of programs? That's the question. And the second one, is there an ongoing problematic with the title that is being brought up to Congress? Interesting. So for institutions to avoid any type of uh, action, uh, for losing funding. Uh, there would be uh, complaints that are done with the US Department of Education through the Office of Civil Rights, OCR, if you will. And when that happens, it kind of puts an institution on notice about the fact that they're being observed and monitored for a situation that's going on. And if they still don't take any action to resolve the conflict of the situation that's going on on their campus or the irregularity, if you will, then this particular agency will take further action to put them on a list that is publicized as well as to take sanctions for an institution to take action. So it's not just losing money or losing funding. It is about mm -hmm. ensuring that they correct the issues that exist within their campus as well. So there, yeah. there are institutions when they hear OCR, they get very scared. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, that would be ways where Congress looks to regulate what's happening at a given institution, whether it's small or whether it's large. Okay, great. So thank you, Jasmine, for your question. And any other question? We still have time. Uh, the event is, for, since we know that this topic is so uh, trendy right now, not only in the news, but also in social media and everything. And it's, it's, although in one of the video, I agree with the, the, the last interview person that she said that it's a human behavior that is not new, but it has been a, a getting grow, growing with the social media. It's important to understand this and make sure and, and acknowledge uh, Bella, this, these questions. Hey, I just want to say thank you for the answer. <laughs> no problem. Any other question to Jesenia? Jesenia, uh, in the meantime, someone, I, I want to ask you, since you are an expert on this topic and this is part of your role, I guess, in, in your institution, right? That is correct. A, a deal with that. Have you tell us about uh, uh, an example without, without any names and without any disclosure below, below of the confidence of the situation that you can let us know the result, how you uh, 
uh, put into action. All, all Absolutely. These. So one of the last investigations that I handled was early this year uh, between a faculty member and a student. And interestingly enough, the faculty member came forward after receiving months of text messages from a student uh, where he was unaware of who the student was, uh, but also, uh, so the, the student was also being propositioning. And so the faculty member felt very afraid to come forward and was actually feeling sense of shame, but mm -hmm. uh, finally came forward. And within a 30 day period, the matter was investigated. It, it, it was sanctioned and the actions were very quick. Accommodations were given to the faculty member to ensure that there was no contact between that individual and the student. The student was put on notice with a support person involved. All this happened within a 30 day period. And so mm -hmm. to think of the fact that with Title IX, the expectation of action is immediate. It has to happen immediate. It has to be where all parties get accommodations, they're safe and also that they have support individuals available. Support person could be a colleague for a faculty or staff member, or it could be a unionized individual. It could be a lawyer, it could be a, a counsel, a guide, a friend. Mm -hmm. uh, for a student, it could also be uh, a friend, uh, an affiliate, a family member, or someone on campus that is assigned to them for support. And so mm -hmm. we do this as a form of support to everybody in this process, because as I mentioned before, it is very intimidating to go through something that you've never had happen before and to yeah. not have an appropriate support available, but then to ensure that everyone is safe and that everybody has an opportunity to be heard about the situation. But yeah, that's the one that comes to mind when I think of how okay. quickly I had to respond, how quickly I had to investigate mm -hmm. and how quickly action <laughs> needed to take place. And, and in terms of the, Bella, eh, of the, how the people accepted uh, Bella, the resolution, the, is that so, like something that was like i'll tell you with that situation the student was a popular student on the campus and so that is where the cancel culture became prevalent because it was very there was a lack of understanding about what was going on and why the student was being targeted or why the student had to uh take a a, a leave and you know i had to do a response and i had to have a town hall just about this very situation to address why the action took place, why the situation was so prevalent, and also what is available on the campus that people were unfamiliar with. And I was very surprised to know that many people were unfamiliar with the role that mm -hmm. I serve as well as the resources. And so it really exacted a conversation that was really important to students and then to reinforce training so that they knew what was available and why certain actions are taken, whether it's by my office or for those that I'm affiliated with. Oh, okay. And after that, that I guess it was the first time that happened on your college, I have the, uh, on your it's campus. The first time, it was the first time that it became prevalent oh, so because okay. it was a very popular person on the campus. So that's uh, why I say it can be of a differing situation. Okay. But after that, that, did you see like a more people coming to approach you? Because probably enough, yes. no, nobody <laughs> can know that they have are on this situation unless they know about so, others. Interestingly enough, yes, more complaints came forward. But exactly. then, interestingly enough, academic departments were asking for more training. Um, exactly. External uh, uh, partners were asking for more training about this because it's mm -hmm. an emerging situation that there's no real name to it. And so exactly. that's where it became a very big conversation on my campus and in oh, other. Wow other campuses as well. Excellent, but thank you. That was really, I learned a lot as well because in Puerto Rico, <laughs> Evela, eh, I bet some of our colleagues agree that it's not like as, Evela, as common as in the States as we have heard on the news, but definitely happens as well. So Absolutely. thank you so much for all this information. Any other question or any other comment eh, to share before we eh, finish the, officially the presentation of, of the topic today or the discussion because I love it the 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 pooping and the interaction so because then eh, Bella, we we you you learn how how and we have a very good representation on this uh around 50 people that join us at at, at one time eh, from Puerto Rico and US so it was excellent to have this feedback as well any questions
I don't see any other, but any anything else that you may want, anything that you want the audience to, Bella, make sure they learn today with your this discussion uh, to close your presentation, Yesenia, please. Just that you know that please reach out to your institution, know what your resources are, know the people who are there to help support you and serve you, and also to ensure that you know that these are supports and protections that are available for everyone everyone on your campus. It doesn't matter what role or function you have, um, this coordinator or this person in this role is there to help support and serve you. And also to provide guidance, not just for compliance. So don't be afraid to reach out. There's always that open door policy with everyone. And I wanna thank you for the time. No, thank you, Jasenia. it was wonderful. Hey, although I know you for a, a few few years now, I didn't know you were an expert on this, and I'm so happy that uh, Bella, uh, that you were able to be uh, part of this Student Leadership Showcase uh, Tour English Edition. Thank you so much. We will coordinate later because this is a topic that I know is going to grow and grow, Bella, Absolutely. and we need the support for this. As as Kate, thank you so much. Thank you also to the audience for the questions and comments. And now we would like to move uh, to the final part of the event. And we will thank ask, a, no, thank you. Please don't go so you, we can help, you can help us celebrate the oh, winners. Okay. And, and also in the meantime, Yesenia, please send us a PDF format of your presentation. I absolutely so, will. See, so we can share it with the recording when it's, it's ready, uh, uh, because I know they will definitely would love to have that. So Stephanie is with us today. Thank you, Stephanie. And she's our social media and marketing di director. And she was helping us to give us a vela to, to select the names for the giveaway ruffle uh, of the Amazon gift card. We have four uh, of 25 each. You will receive it. The winners will receive it by uh, email. Uh, so you can use it uh, online and buy whatever you want. Uh, Bella. And today uh, we will start. Remember that in the in the rules we always say that these ruffles uh, uh, prices are for students. So please, uh, when if your name is selected and you're not a student, please put it on the chat. Use the chat. Uh, the another rule, very important, is that you have to be present to win. So please make sure that uh, you, if you heard your name, put right away on the chat that you are present. And, and uh, so we know that you are here and you are the winner and that you are a student, very important. So let's start with the first one. Let's see who's gonna be. And Isari, please make sure you select, a, write down the name and the institution. Okay, the ruffles. The okay, the name is Carlos Delgado from Nuc Arecibo. Carlos, are you here and are you a student? Are you present? Let me see, Carlos, Carlos, Carlos. Carlos Delgado, yes, you're here. Can you, Carlos, put on the chat? Oh, yes. Ah, you're a faculty. Hi, Carlos. So sorry. <laughs> Thank you for being present, but let's, uh, <laughs> let's do. No, I know. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, we need another name for students. Thank you, Carlos, anyway, for being here. Okay, let's see. David Oliveras from Columbia Central University. David. Could you please put on the chat if you are here and if you are a student? Very important, David. Let me see if I see it here. David, a la una. No, I don't see David. Okay, so if he's not present, these are the two rules. You have to be present and you have to be student. No, so let's run again. The, ¿Cómo se diría, Yesenia? Ruleta. Roulette. How do you call it? Wheel. Wheel, the wheel. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. From Aguadilla, Interamérica. Emeliangi. Espérate. Emeliangeli. 
Emily Angeli Miranda. Eh, hey, present, are you a student? Emily Angeli? Yes, okay, we have the first winner, Emily Angeli Miranda from Interamericana de Aguadilla. Eh, Isaris is taking note and you will receive that next week eh, on your email. Please make sure eh, be pending. Uh, we have a second uh, amaz Amazon card, gift card of $25. Thank you, congratulations. Okay. Valeria Franceschi, Franceschi de UAGM Carolina. Are you here? Valeria? Valeria, are you here? We don't have any Valeria in the participants. Okay, pues. Remove and let's go to, we are in the second one, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Nemesis Esquilin, Felicier de UAGM. Are you here? Nemesis, check it out. You check the names, I check the. Put on the chat, write on the chat if you're here, please. And if you are students, do you see any Nemesis? No. Nope. Okay, for remove. We still have 33 uh, participants, so please don't go a few more minutes to see if you are the winner of the next $25 Amazon gift card. Kelvin Fontanes, UAGM Carolina. Are you here, Kelvin? Yes, are you a student, Kelvin? Kelvin, excuse me. Yes. Yes, excellent. But then second Amazon card, card gift card goes to Kelvin Fontanes UAGM Carolina. I said take note of that and we, you will receive that by email next week. The third one. Thank you. Congratulations, Kelvin. The third one is Catherine Hernandez, Carmona, Ana Jimenez. Are you here, Catherine? Catherine, a la una. Yes, Catherine, yes. are you a student? Are you a student from UAGM? Okay, well, great. Congratulations, Catherine. Hernandez Carmona is our third winner of the $25. Amazon gift card. So the last one, who's gonna be the last one? Let's see. Christopher Gonzalez Tañón, Interamerican University of Puerto Rico. Christopher, are you here? Christopher, a la una. Do you see a Christopher here, around here? No, I don't see any Christopher. Okay, but the last one still an opportunity for the rest who still connected to win. Let's see who is the winner of the fourth. Josman, Josman Betancourt from the United States House of Representatives, but you are also studying in, at Interamerica and your master's degree, is that correct? Just my are you here? Oh, let's see if he's still, if he's still here. If not. Correct. Está o no está? Yes, he is. Ah, and you're still a student, right? And unable to participate. Uh, and unable to participate. Okay, so that means that you're giving away your gift. Ah, okay, but no problem. We understand. I know that you have some restriction. No problem. But thank you, Jasmine, anyway, for being here and for uh, being able to uh, give another person the opportunity to win. So thank you so much. You're so kind. Okay, Iberta Rios, Alvisi University. I know you. 
you were here, but you are the were for the president. So I don't know. No, I, I, I cannot accept, but I'm happy that, you know, I won. I didn't win, but I felt flattered. <laughs> I, I was chosen. I know. I know. Thank you, Berta. Anyway, for being here, I know you are a staffer of the Carlos Alviso. So thank you so yeah. much for joining us. Great, great presentation. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Berta. Thank you so much. And say hi to the president and your colleagues on my behalf. Thank you. She's from uh, Yesenia from Carlos Alviso University uh, here in Puerto Rico. Uh, okay. Who is the winner of the last one? Maricel Pagan, Marchand, Nook University. Are you here, Maricel? Maricel a la una. I don't Maricel. see any. Maricel, Maricel. Pagan. Okay, the but the, the, last, the last gift card doesn't want to go. Let's see. We still have 30, 31 people here, so let's see. And we still have one minute to go. Sara Torres, Interamerican University, San Germán. Sara, have you, are you here? Sara? You can use the audio also because we already... Ajá, hello, escucha. Ajá, Sara, are you here? Are you, eres estudiante? Yes, I'm here, but not, I'm not a student. I'm a oh, professor. Oh, okay, uh, but thank you. Thank okay, you for your honesty and thank you for being here and participating okay. so much. Bye -bye. Okay, thank you. Okay, but students, you still have time to win the last Amazon gift card. Let's see who's going to be the winner. Lian Alvarado Rodriguez, Ana Jemendez. Lian, are you here? Lian, a la una. Veja un Lian. No, no, no. Okay, pues. Continue. I know that it's a Friday and it's kind of, Bella, but we are so happy that you were able to participate today and you, we still have people connected. So, Kiria Reyes Rodriguez, UAGM Barceloneta, are you here? No, Kiria. we don't have any Kiria. Oh, okay, pues seguimos. Sorry, okay, these names, they were here because the only way their name are there is because they submitted information during the event, but I know some of them are not there until the end. So Gabriela Rodriguez Sanchez, Interamericana de Puerto Rico, Recinto de Ponce. Are you here, Gabriela? Mm -hmm. No la ve? Ok, no. pues seguimos. Don't worry. The people have still have time. Have time to be here. Kelvin Pajano de la Rosa, UAM. Kelvin, are you here? Okay, there is a Kelvin. Y eres estudiante? Are you student, Kelvin? Okay, so we have the fourth and final winner of the Amazon gift card of $25. The four of you, congratulations. Thank you so much for uh, uh, being here until the end. And we hope that you enjoy the gift cards when you receive it by email next week. On behalf of HITS, we thank you for your assistance and active participation during this event. Before we go, we like to remind you of the next webinar that we have this semester. Remember to stay connected with HITS through our social media accounts and our website um, and check it out uh, and sign in and register for the next events. We hope to see you on the June events. Remember that the next one is uh, in June 15th with Dr. Juan Tito Melendez talking about what's next for distance learning. And the last one is gonna be June 30th and especially when with our colleague of California State University in San Bernardino and the staffers, administrators, and faculty members who join this event and would like are interested in joining and uh, participate of the Heads Academy. You have until uh, May 25 to submit your uh, application. If you have any doubts, don't hesitate to contact us at heads at, at info at heads.org or call us to our uh, 
phone numbers in the office or to my mobile. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Yesenia, for your excellent uh, participation, excellent presentation. And um, please uh, make sure to uh, uh, see our me media accounts. We always uh, post when the recording and the presentation is ready for you to go to the uh, HEADS website to download the presentation and access the recording if you want to uh, go back and see this uh, or share it with any of your colleagues that you think this topic will be interested for. Thank you again. Have a wonderful weekend because it's Friday. And also, uh, we hope to see you in the next event that we will help. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Yesenia. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you to our staff. Thank you to Stephanie to help who helped us with the with the wheel. And also to Diane who helped me with the presentation and the video. And Isari who helped us at, at meeting uh, the people, uh, the participants to the Zoom uh, is a, a room. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. And until next time. Bye-bye. Take care. Oh yeah, happy Mother's Day to all. Thank you, Jasmine, to remember. Yeah, it's a it's a it's happy Mother's Weekend. Uh, next uh, next uh, Sunday. So ha to all the moms in that chat, happy Mother's Day. I hope you enjoy it with your family. Have a good day to everyone and happy weekend. Take care. Let me see.